As many of you probably noticed, the Bluff Ave website probably was not designed for this many people to join it and abruptly crashed yesterday and we were unable to get uh, anything going with that. Uh, so most of you probably got the email from me last night uh, saying that and what we're going to do is switch to Poker Stars. Uh, Poker Stars unfortunately has some restrictions that made it a little complicated for us and I'm not going to bore you with all the details of what we had to do but ultimately we had to create a whole bunch of accounts on Poker Stars make a bunch of clubs and in each club we're making two tables and in the end we now have the capacity uh, I think for 180 or maybe even close to 200 people to play cash at the same time and I don't think we're ever going to need more than that um, so so we switched over to Poker Stars. I sent a detailed email out. Is there anybody who's registered for the class that did not get that email with those instructions? No, okay. And I know there are some people that have asked me if they can audit. And if you're in that category and you want to play with the class, just send me an email and I'll send those instructions to you as well so you can join. Uh, we do have some other people lurking in there. Uh, my wife joined this morning and her, it was actually good feedback for me because I'm used to playing a lot of poker and I've played a lot online and so she and I uh, played against each other and I could see her cards because I was standing over her shoulder so it wasn't really fair and she got really mad she said I was taking money from her but the the thing that she pointed out the most which I hadn't been acutely aware of is the pace of play online is very very fast if it's the first time you're ever doing it you get about eight seconds to act so one of the things I would encourage you to do is to start thinking about what you want to do in a hand if you have say nine people at your table and each one is going to get eight seconds to act you actually have quite a bit of time before it gets to you so don't start thinking about what you want to do when it's your turn start thinking about it right away I would say after your first hour of playing you will get much much more comfortable than you will be in the first half hour so just know that it all looks really fast, it can seem overwhelming, like even finding where to put your mouse and what to do, uh, how to click, but once you get used to it, you should be fine. Um, we want everyone to start playing tonight. Um, last night, we got 90 students, when I went to bed, were already in the system. I know there's a bit of a turnaround because you have to wait for me or the course assistants to approve you into the various clubs, but we're trying to do it quickly. And in fact, we had, uh, some tables going last night. I even played for a while and I saw some of you there. Who had the aces against me? I had jacks, they had aces, we both made a full house, you did. Nice hand. <laughs> uh, that can happen sometimes. Jacks is a very tough hand to play. Um, so what we're going to do is I made uh, another trophy. It looks just like the other trophies that I showed you, the glass with um, cash game champion for this class. And Unfortunately, I'm going to need a little assistance from all of you in order to figure out who deserves that trophy. And it's going to require something you don't find a lot in a poker room, which is honesty. Um, so what we're going to do is you're going to self-report your cash results. It's not entirely unaudited. I'll tell you how I can audit, though. Um, so when you join on Poker Stars, you get $35,000 in Poker Stars fake money. And immediately at the top right of your screen, there's a button to push for free chips. And it will give you 15,000 more. So you start with 50,000. Every four hours that you're running this program, the Poker Stars program, whether you're playing or not, you have an option to add on 15,000 chips. It just says free chips, you click it, and then another counter starts counting down from four hours. What we're asking you to do, if you want to be eligible for the trophy, some of you might give up early on and say there's no way I'm going to win that thing but if you think you might we want you to limit you yourselves to um, five buy-ins so I will get to that actually in the next slide so let me let me get to that in a minute so we want to encourage people to play between 7 and 11 p.m. but the play will be available anytime I looked uh, about an hour ago and I saw three people were in one of the rooms playing so as long as there are a few other people willing to play you should be able to play in the main menu, you'll be able to see what's going on on the tables and who's there. Okay, so I'm also going to do a dry run of a tournament because I know we ran into unexpected uh, aspects of running cash games and I'm worried that when we try to run our big satellite tournament, all of a sudden I'll find out that it's a limit of 30 people or something silly like that. 
So we're going to try to run a tournament either this weekend or on Monday. Um, and just look for an email from me. That won't count, so to speak. It's not a satellite. It's just going to be a practice tournament. Now, for the cash trophy, to be eligible, uh, like I said, you start with 50,000 chips and no more than five add-ons. This is the place where we need your honesty. Keep track of how often you add on. It's okay to add on, but if you add on more than five, you have to take yourself out of the running for the cash trophy. By noon on Thursday, January 23rd, the second to last day of the class, I'm going to have a Google Doc and I'm going to give all of you access to edit it. And I want you to enter what your cash balance is in your account to confirm that you didn't add on more than five times. And then you have to make an adjustment for tournament subtraction. And the reason is that the tournaments that we're going to have you play cost 20,000 chips to enter. So number one, make sure that when it's time for the satellites, you have 20,000. If you're getting close to not having that, go ahead and do the add-on of the 15,000 maybe a couple of times. But you need to make sure you have that. Um, then here's the part where we don't trust you. In the top right of your screen, there's a, um, this is your, your chip balance. So that's my current balance. This is your picture of you, and this is the time of day. Now I did do a bunch of add-ons, but I also schooled a few of you last night. So that's how I got that. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so this is what your uh, PokerStars lobby will look like. Notice in the bottom right here is the home games. So the first time you go in here, you need to click on home games. And then you can click on join a, po a poker club here and type in the number that I emailed you and the code word that I emailed you to join the poker club. It'll go in here as pending until one of us adds you. And then you'll start seeing all the tables for all the clubs down here. Notice it says players zero, because I took the screenshot at 5.30 this morning. None of you were playing, which I was glad to see. And if you click on one of the tables, you'll see the players here. So if your friends are there and you want to play with them, you can say play now and then join the table. So play around with that and get used to it. And we really want everyone um, to get started as quickly as possible. And we'll do as good a job as we can confirming those requests to join. Now, tournaments are a lot of fun. They're very different from cash games. They make for great television. The World Series of Poker main event is held with a 30-minute delay pretty much live on ESPN every year. And um, we know that there's more luck in tournaments than in cash games. And one of the things I'm going to show you in this class is the math that proves that there's more luck in tournaments than in cash games. Anybody can win on any given day. And I'm going to talk a little bit for a minute about how Chris Moneymaker changed the poker world. So let's take ourselves to the 2003 main event when poker wasn't on TV regularly. Most people thought it was just like a little game you played nickel and dime in college with your friends. Um, the 2003 main event had a $10,000 entry fee and 839 players entered that as opposed to last year when 6,140 entered. Think about the prize pool when 6,100 people are paying $10,000 each to enter the tournament. The final three players at the end of the day, or at the end of the week, um, were Dan Harrington, who is the author of my favorite poker cash book. Sammy Farha is a very famous, aggressive player who plays with an unlit cigarette in his mouth. That's his trademark. He actually, I think, has a cameo in Rounders, so you'll see him there. And then Chris Moneymaker, who was an accountant amateur who paid $30 for a satellite and satellited to satellite to satellite his way into a free main event and then won it. So 10th place went to Phil Ivey, another uh, very famous poker player, considered perhaps the best in the world. Um, and the top three prizes were 2.5 million, 1.3 million, and 650,000. So in the last few years, the main event first place is closer to 10 million. In fact, it was 10 million a couple of years ago. So I want to show you, just so you get a feel for the atmosphere, this is just a couple minute clip. This is the last hand of the 2003 main event, Sammy Farha against Chris Moneymaker. Try to picture yourself someday in one of these seats. They actually put all the cash on the table. Um, one time when there was one of these big televised uh, events, uh, robbers with masks and machine guns came in and stole all that money on the table and discovered it's all fake. It's just like wrapped to look like money. So don't try to steal it. So a little, a little bit of overkill. He made a full house there on the river. All he had to do was, was dodge 
uh, a higher two pair or a set of jacks or something like that. But um, uh, no, actually another jack would have given Chris a full house as well. So really just the 10. Um, so, so that was uh, kind of exciting. And now um, I've, I've, been, I've avoided it for a whole lecture and a little bit, but now we're going to get into some of the more mathematical aspects of poker. Uh, what I'll ask is if you're not comfortable with the math, just get a feel for it. Get some intuitions. If you are comfortable with math, follow along. Please stop me and ask questions if you get lost at any point. So I want to start out with an example, which is house flipping. House flipping is, you know, you buy a house, you fix it up, and you try to sell it for more. So let's say you decide to go into that business, and you find a fixer-upper house that you can buy for $300,000. And you find a contractor, he's an honest guy, does good work, and he tells you that for $80,000, he can take that house and improve it so that you can sell it for $500,000. And you know that your realtor charges 6% to sell the house, and we will ignore transfer taxes and all that stuff. Let's just keep it simple. So the question is, what is your expected value if you undertake this? And I won't make you work it out. I am going to make you do some work today, but not that. This is pretty simple math. You could sell it for 500000 Your costs are in parentheses, 300000 to buy it, $80,000 to fix it up. 6% of $500,000 to sell it, that's $500,000 minus $410,000, $90,000 profit. So should you do it? You should do it. You're going to make $90,000. Well, the truth is that this type of reasoning and this type of calculation is very similar to what you're going to do in a poker hand. So in house flipping, your expected value is the sale price minus the cost of the rehab and the commissions. In a poker hand, your expected value is how much you win when you win a hand minus how much you lose when you lose a hand, or more accurately, how much you win times your probability of winning minus how much you lose times your probability of losing. And the key to poker, remember that yesterday I said be the house, you want to have an edge. And so push your positive expectations. Whenever you have a positive expectation in a hand, you want to get money in, you want to play. And whenever you have a negative expectation, you want to fold and get out of there. So let's look at a hand. We're going to jump right into poker. Let's say that your hand is the ace three of clubs. You have a suited ace. And after the turn, so that we've seen four cards, which are the king of clubs, seven and a four, and the jack of club. This is the board. OK, let me know the minute anybody isn't with me anymore. So I won't keep saying, are you with me? If I don't see a hand, you're with me. Okay, so the pot now contains $50, and you have $20 left, and your head's up. That means, heads up means there are just two of you. So you're playing against another person, you have the ace three of clubs, and this is your board, $50 in the pot, and you have $20 left. Now your opponent is tight and solid. We're going to get to what that means later when we look at opponent types. But that means that he doesn't bluff a lot. He doesn't mess around. He's, he's usually got what his bets represent. And he bets $20, basically putting you all in. And you know him so well that you know he would only do this if he had two pair or better. OK, we're going to make some assumptions here. But this guy, he would never bet all of your chips if he didn't have something like two pair. And so now the question is, should you call or fold? Do you want to put your remaining $20 in? Now, I'm going to give you like 10 seconds to think about it, and then I'm going to ask for show of hands. Granted, I have not taught you this yet, so you're not expected to know it, but I'm wondering what you guys would do, what your intuition is if you were playing right now. So remember, there's $50 in the pot. You have 20 left. He just bet all of your 20, and you have this. And then we're going to look at how I would reason about this and what the math is for your expected value. So now, show of hands of who would call. Show of hands of who would fold. OK. And if you didn't raise your hand, you're going to get um, in trouble because you have to make decisions at the table. Right? <laughs> if you're playing online, they'll just fold your hand. And if you're playing in a casino, somebody will call the clock on you. And that's a thing. So, if you think someone's taking too long, you call the clock on them, 
and they have one minute to act if the dealer determines that they've already had a reasonable amount of time to make the decision. So if somebody calls you for you know, $50,000 in a huge high stakes game, they'll give you plenty of time to make that decision. But if the decision is for $5 and you don't make a decision, they're going to call the clock on you. Okay, so let's continue with this example. If you fold, your expected value is zero, right? You're not going to win any, anything. What about calling? So what we're going to do now is we're going to compute your expected value. And the way that we do that is we determine how is it, what do you need in order to win? And you need a club on the river, right? And only a club. Because if you hit your ace, that's not going to beat their two pair. We said that they have two pair or better. Maybe they have a set, maybe they have two pair. So you absolutely need a club. So we're going to base our calculation on that. Now, how many clubs are there in a deck of poker, not in this hand? Like, walk away from the hand, and if I said to you, here's 52 cards, it's a deck, how many clubs are there? 13, very good, right? One quarter of the cards are clubs. 13 cards in the deck are clubs. Now, you have two clubs, the ace and the three, and there are two clubs on the board, right? So that's four, so four clubs are not remaining in the deck, right? So how many are left if there were 13 and four of them are not in the deck? Nine, right? Okay. So there are nine clubs. Oh, it's right there on the board. Okay, that's not fair. <laughs> um, I should look at the slides before I ask that kind of question. So now, I'm going to say there are 46 unknown cards left. And the reason I say that is there are 52 cards in the deck. And I know six of them. My hand, those two, and the four that are on the board. Just because my opponent has two cards, doesn't change the fact that I could view those as unknown cards, okay? They're basically in the deck. So I know of the 46 unknown cards that there are nine clubs and 37 non-clubs. I'll ask it anyway, is everybody with me? Nine clubs, 37 are not clubs. So let's look at the ratio of nine clubs over 46 cards so of the 46 cards, nine are clubs, that's 0.196, which is 20%. That means that those clubs that are in the deck account for 20% of the cards in the remaining deck. It means that one out of five of the 46 cards that I don't know about is a club. If I were to take this scenario and repeat it a thousand times, turn over a card and see if it's a club, 20% of the time, it would be a club. Okay? So at this point, what is my chance, what is my probability, in, as, as stated as a percentage, of winning the hand? 20%, right? Because if a club comes, I win the hand. If a non-club comes, I definitely lose the hand. 20% of the cards are clubs, so my chance of winning this hand is 20%. So how much do I win 20% of the time when I win this hand? I'm going to win $70, right? Because there's 50 in the pot. My opponent just bet 20. That's 70. Before I act, there's actually 70 in the pot now. Does everybody see why I win 70? And how often do I win $70? 20% of the time, right? So 20% of the time, I'm going to win $70. So we can calculate that as an expected value. We say, $70, 20% of the time, I can expect to win $14 in this scenario when I hit a club, on average, based on how often I'm going to hit a club. Now, 80% of the time, I'm going to lose, right? The other non-clubs are going to come. And when I lose, how much do I lose? I lose 20, because that's how much more I put in. The pot's already gone. You might say, well, what about the 25? That's my share of the pot. You don't have a share of the pot. The pot is the pot, and if you don't play for it, you don't get it, right? So you're going to lose that extra 20, and so 80% of the time, you're going to lose 20 with an expectation of minus 16, okay? So this is, this is probability theory, but it's very, very basic. It should be pretty clear that your expected value is the probability of winning times the amount you win, and then subtract from that the probability of losing times the amount you lose. So my expectation in this hand is that I'm going to lose $2. In other words, 
if I had this scenario, if I had these four cards and those two cards in my hand, and the bet was what the bet was, and the pot was what the pot was, and I did this 10,000 times, I would expect to lose $20,000. This is how the casino makes money, right? There's an edge. I have a negative edge in this hand. You do not want to repeat things where you have negative edges. So all of you that said that you should fold were right. You should fold this. Okay. Now, let me, let me change the example slightly and see if we get a different result. What if, what if there had been 180 in the pot instead of 50? Okay? So now, how many people think you should call now? If it's 50, you fold. How many people think you should fold? Okay, good. Um, so let's move to that example. I've grayed out the top of the slide because everything else is the same. There are still 13 clubs in the deck. All our probabilities are the same. But when I calculate how much I win, I win $200, which is the 180 that's in the pot, plus the $20 that my opponent bet, right? So my expectation when I win is that I'm going to win $200, but that's going to happen 20% of the time giving me an expected value of 40. Nothing changes about losing. 80% of the time, I still lose that $20 bet. So I still have a minus 16 expectation for the losing part of this. And when I put it together, I see that the expected value, on average, I'm going to win $24. Everybody with me so far? So let's see what happened here. When the pot was similar to the size of the bet, right? The pot was 50, the bet was 20. I said fold because you're only going to get a club 20% of the time. But when the pot was enormous relative to the bet, I said you should call because your expectation is so high when you win, it dominates what happens when you lose. And this is a concept in poker which is the most fundamental and I think the most important concept in the theory of poker is pot odds. So we have a name for that. And pot odds is an easier way to calculate the previous example. Now some of you are sitting here going, the professor just told me that I get eight seconds to act when I'm playing a hand on Poker Stars. And now he wants me to do probability math. How is that possible? Well, the good news is that we're going to look at a lot of theory, and then we're going to learn lessons from the theory, and then we're going to, look, we're going to get some rules of thumb. And the rules of thumb are based on the theory, but they can be calculated immediately. So if an experienced poker player were to see the situation where they need one club to win, they've been in that situation thousands of times. They know it's a 20% chance. They know how to look at the pot and look at the bet and make that decision. They don't have to do the math. The math is for your education, but uh, this is the kind of thing that experienced players do in their head. So what are the pot odds? It's the ratio of the amount in the pot to the amount that you have to call of the bet. So in the last hand, it was 70 to 20, right? We had $70 in the pot after the opponent bet. So you need to calculate the pot odds after you face a bet, and you add the amount of that bet to what's already in the pot. And then you take the ratio of that, of what's in the pot, to how much you have to call. So $70 in the pot, it'll cost you 20. The pot odds are 70 to 20, so you divide them to get the ratio to 1. So 3.5 to 1, okay? What does it mean for the, rate, for the pot odds to be 3.5 to 1? It means that the 20% is the chance of hitting the club, not the pot odds. So I got that backwards. And you guys should catch me if I do that again, which I will 100 times. Um, so remember that we have 37 non-clubs in the deck and 9 clubs. And so now we're going to look at another concept that goes into pot odds, which is your odds against. The odds against hitting your hand, the odds against hitting your hand here is 37 to 9. 37 non-clubs, you lose. 9 clubs, you win. The odds against are 37 to 9. It's a handy way to calculate things because if we divide that, we get 4 to 1, which is a number we can compare to the pot odds. Okay? So let's review. The two things that we're going to calculate are the pot odds, right? How do we calculate the pot odds? The total in the pot after the bet, divided by the bet. That's our pot odds. Okay, in this case it's 3.5 to 1. How do we calculate the odds against? The number of cards that make you lose the hand divided by the number of cards that make you win the hand. 
Okay? So that's four to one. And here is the fundamental law of poker. Whenever the odds against are worse than the pot odds, don't call. So worse means that the number is higher. So the odds against four to one is higher, four is higher than 3.5. Okay, so we're gonna work through a few hands and we're gonna do these calculations together and start thinking about how brave you are because I think the second or third example, it's gonna say on the slide, a volunteer student comes up to the board and solves this. Um, so if you wanna be that person, uh, that'll be great. Otherwise I get to pick which person comes up. All right, whenever the pot odds are better than the odds against, you call. Okay, so that's going to be something that we're going to look at over and over. So let's take that example where we had 180 before the opponent bet 20. What are the pot odds? And remember that the pot odds has nothing to do with the cards. The odds against is the cards. The pot odds is simply the money in the pot and the bet. So this is one I want you to think for a second. Show me your hand if you want to give me an answer. There's 180 in the pot. Your opponent bets 20, and that puts you all in. What are your pot odds? Okay, I'm going to. I know I'm going to call on you, but I'm going to wait for you to answer it to let more people think about it. Okay. Nine to one is close. I think you, you forgot to do something though. Anybody else? Yes. 10 to one. And this is um, a very, very common thing to do is just to take the 180 and divide by 20. But you forgot to add in the bet. So it's 180 plus 20 and then divide by the 20. Okay. So now I'm gonna let, um, I think his name is Mickey Numbers or Vinny Numbers, somebody with a really cool poker name explain pot odds to you. We're gonna beat pot odds to death because it can get complicated. It's the most important thing that you're gonna learn in this class. And so I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of examples. But I, I like the way this guy explains it and he's got a cool poker name. Okay, so first thing that you should take away from this besides the fact that we're about to look at a bunch of pot odds calculations and examples is that your bet when you're at the poker table should usually be around half of the pot. So I noticed last night I was playing with some of you guys and I'm sure many of you are beginners. The people that jumped on it the first night might not be, but there, was, there were people that would bet the same on every street. Bet the same on the flop, bet the same on the turn, bet the same on the river. You never want to do that because when you bet the pot on the flop, or when you bet on the flop and the opponent calls, now there's going to be a lot more in the pot. So then when you go to bet on the turn, if you bet the same amount, you're betting a tiny fraction of the pot and then on the river, you're betting an even tinier fraction of the pot. So you always want to be around half of what's currently in the pot as a rule of thumb. And we're going to also look at some of the theory as to why in a bit. So let's look at an example. You hold, oh, sorry, question. Yeah, sorry, before we go ahead, in the last example, isn't there like a percent chance that one of those nine runs will give your opponent a full house? That's a great question. So the question was, uh, if it's possible that one of the clubs that gives you the flush would give your opponent an even better hand like a full house. And I like the fact that you're thinking that way. I had devised the example to purposefully make that impossible. So on the, what is the requirement for someone to make a full house? Oh, no, you're right. So if the board paired on the river and your opponent had a set, uh, they would make a full house. The thing about that example is that your opponent's already ahead. Um, no, no, you're right, you're right. I've talked myself into it. Um, you may not have had as many outs as you thought. Right, because you have two pair, and if so, if your opponent has two pair, and they hit one of those cards, and it's a club on the river, you lose. Good point, I like it. Anyone else uh, notice any mistakes of mine that I don't know about? <laughs> but in general, you also have to um, not be where the monster's under the bed too much. So don't always assume that your opponent has the one hand that is going to crush you, because they very often don't. And in general, we're, as we look at things, we're going to have to base it on best case or most likely thing that somebody has. But that was, that was a great point. Um, okay, so let's look at a situation where you hold a pair of aces. 
And right now I want everybody to feel happy thoughts because that's always great, right? You love it, you got a pair of aces. It's gonna happen one out of every 202 hands that you get, so it's not gonna happen that often. Uh, when it does happen, you'll be excited. And now you have a flop and a turn and you're in the situation where this is your, your board. So good news, bad news, right? The good news is you have a set of aces and the bad news is there are four clubs out there. So in this example, we're going to say that we have a pot of $150 and you have $50 left and you're up against two players. One of them has $200 and the other has $100. Everybody with me in this example? Okay. The player with the $200 goes all in and the second player calls. Should you call or fold? Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a little bit, a few seconds to digest this. All right, everybody who thinks you should call, raise your hand. Everybody who thinks you should fold. Everyone is undecided. Okay, you guys, your hand folds. All right, you have to decide. Um, all right, so let's look at the situation here. We have our, our, our pocket aces is our hand, this is the board, this is the pot. For the entire course, I'm gonna use the top right corner as, as a cheat sheet, just to remember what we're talking about for context. So I'm going to say that it's safe to assume that each of your opponents has a club in their hand, right? One of them bet 200, the other one went all in and bet 100. Even though you only have 50, they're still playing a side pot against each other. And I think it's safe to assume, now to the point earlier, yeah, maybe they have something else, but um, when I say it's safe to assume, it means that's going to be the assumption that we're going to use in this hand. Okay, so how much does it cost you to call if you call? Let's see a hand if anybody knows. Yes? No, no, how much money will you have to pay to call? $50, right, because that's what you've got left and they've both gone all in. And then the rest goes into the side pot, so we're not going to worry about that. And Five to one, you anticipated the next question is what are your pot odds? And the pot odds are five to one. And why are the pot odds five to one? Yes. So there is money in the side pot, but why are your pot odds five to one? You, you calculated it, so how did you do that? Yeah, I don't think everyone heard that. So there's 150 in the pot, and you're going to get $50 from each of the other two players into the main pot that they're playing against you. And so when they put their 50s into the main pot, that makes the main pot have $250 in it. Then there'll be a side pot that we're not going to worry about because we don't care about it. Although we are going to factor the side pot into what their thinking was and how they played the hand, right? Because they went all in. So that's the reason I'm putting them each on a club. So the situation is I've got two opponents. I think each of them has a flush. And I'm getting five to one on my money. So now the question is, how many cards can come on the river that are going to give me the best hand? And is there a, is there a question or? No, OK. So the question is, we'll call those outs. An out is a card in the deck, in which case you win. And think about this and how many outs do we have? Yes. Ten. Right? Why do we have ten outs? Right. So we have one ace, three jacks, three eights, three fours. All of those cards give us the winning hand, and no other card gives us a winning hand if we're up against a flush. Because in the case of a jack, an eight, or a four coming, we make a full house. And if an ace comes, we make four of a kind, or quads. So is there anyone that's not clear on why I'm saying we have 10 outs? The 10 cards, yes? What would happen if um, there's like a club on the wizard? OK, so that's an interesting question. The question was, what would happen if there was a club on the river? And the answer to that is, if, is that one of the other players would win unless one of them had a two of clubs and the other had a three of clubs 
and, and they had no other clubs in their hand. Right? In the scenario where one of your opponents has the two of clubs and the other has the three of clubs, um, every, if the club that came on the river wasn't, obviously couldn't be the two or the three, then all three players would chop because there would be a bigger flush on the board than anyone could have. But I will caveat that by saying I don't think they went all in with the two or three of clubs. So if one of them has a bigger club in their hand, like maybe the queen of clubs or the king of clubs, and another club came, then that player would win because they would have a higher flush because they would have the king. Okay, so everybody comfortable saying that there are 10 cards in the deck that are winning cards for us? So how many cards on the river are losing cards for us? Yes? 30? So let's go back to how many cards are there in the deck that we don't know? No, there's 46, because there's 52 cards, and then there are six cards that we know, so there's 46 that we don't. Right? 52 minus 6 is 46. And of those 46, 10 of them are really good for us, and the rest, 36, are bad for us. So the odds against us, 36 bad cards, 10 good cards, are 3.6 to 1, right? And the pot odds are 5 to 1. So you should call. And I think this should be an interesting result, considering the fact that most of the hands went up for folding earlier. So what you need to do, let's look at the steps that we took. You're going to first calculate your pot odds. Then you're going to figure out how many cards in the deck will give you a better hand. And I started with the assumption that your two opponents have a flush. So you know that there are 10 cards. And then you calculate your odds against. It's the bad cards divided by the good cards. And then that gives you your decision. Now, this problem actually has an interesting little subplot, which is that the odds against are actually 3.4 to 1, not 3.6 to 1. Um, you know why? Don't, don't say it yet. That's great. I want everyone to think about it. You're going to be the guy to answer it. But if you think about this problem, try to figure out why the odds are actually 3.4 to 1. I've already got a, a volunteer to answer that, but just try to think about that. If you're new to poker and you figure this out on your own, you're next level. That's awesome. OK, wh why don't you tell us? That's exactly right. So I'll repeat it. We said that there were 36 unknown cards in the deck. But in the problem, we assumed that each of our opponents has a club. So there's only 34 unknown cards with respect to can a club come. So we're going to calculate. Anytime you can do subtraction, card subtraction, by looking at other information that you know, sometimes when a dealer is dealing in a live game as opposed to online, they accidentally flip over a card. You should take that card into consideration as not being one of the unknown cards when you do your calculations. All right, so it's time for an exercise. OK, so this is going to be our problem. What's your name? I'm Lucas. Lucas. Lucas is going to help us. Uh, your hand is 7-8. The board comes on the turn 5-6-2 ace, two spades, and two hearts. There's 180 in the pot, and your opponent goes all in for $50, and you have them covered. Now, in order to make this uh, a, a problem that avoids the earlier hypothetical, um, we're going to say that your opponent accidentally shows you his hand. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and so now we have a lot of information. We know that your opponent has the ace, king of spades, and should you call or fold? So before Lucas tackles this problem, let's get intuition. Don't do math. Just tell me what you think. Call? Hands up? Fold? OK. Most to be voted. All right, so let's figure it out. What is the first, Lucas, what is the first step in, in doing this type of calculations? Pot odds. Pot odds, right? 
So the first thing you're going to do is calculate pot odds. And we, let's not do it yet. What's the second step? Actually, how many hits do you have? How many outs? Oh, yeah. yeah, how many outs do you have in order to know the odds against? Right. right, okay. So how many outs? And step three, make your decision. So why don't you go up to the board and do these calculations and uh, feel free to ask the class to help you. Right, so he has calculated that there's 230 in the pot after the $50 bet. You divide 230 by 50 and somehow he did that in his head and got it right. And that's 4.6. And so your odds, your pot odds are 4.6 to 1. What, what I would do, Lucas, yeah. is I would ask the class if anybody knows how many outs there are, because you can use them to help you. Does anybody know how many outs there are? Six. six. Okay, yeah. Who said six? Okay, we've got a ringer here. Uh, what are the six outs? <laughs> and why are there not eight? Are you asking me or him? Everybody. Oh, okay. Lucas, you're running the show, but right. we need to figure <laughs> out what the six outs are. So the six outs, uh, are we, so I don't know, do we assume here that he's going to hit a flush? Um, well, here's the deal. So the question was, can we assume that he's going to hit a flush? And the answer is, we have all the information we could possibly need, because for any given river card, we can determine who's going to win. Right. So if he hits a flush, that's not one of our outs. Okay. Right, right. We'll win with a straight. Which cards give us the straight? So there's four nines and four fours. Right, so four nines and four fours is eight cards. Right, but either of the spades will give him a flush. Perfect, right? If you hit the four of spades, you make your straight, but he makes a flush. Okay. Right, so you have six cards, which are the fours, the nines that are not spades. Okay, so what are your odds against? Well, wait, there are, there are 44 unknown cards at this point, right? 40. You, you have 52 cards in the deck, right. and you know eight of them. Right. And then you've got six hits. Right. So that'd be 38. Well, let's, let's write it down. So you have six outs, unknown, unknowns. 44 unknowns, and six. Yeah. So yeah, you're right, 38 and six. Minus six, 38. Can you do 38 divided by six in your head? Whoa. Okay. I'm not going to ask you what your major is. Uh, um, so now your pot odds are 4.6 and your odds against are 6.3. So should you call? You should fold. Everybody see that? Thanks, Lucas. Okay. But Lucas is off the hook, but you guys are not. I'm going to change it up a little. What if your opponent goes all in for 10 instead of 50? Do your odds against change? No. And we know the odds against are, I lost it, 6.38, something over 6, right? So that doesn't change. But what are your pot odds? If he goes all in for 10, there's 180 in the pot, so that's 90 over 10, right? So 9 to 1. So nine, 9 to 1 is really good pot odds, you should call. And that's kind of intuitive too, right? If there's $180 in the pot and somebody bets 10, are you like ever folding there? Yes, if you have no outs. <laughs> okay. All right, so now we have another exercise. This time you can stay in your seats, but I want you to work with a partner in the class. Somebody sitting next to you, um, you're going to be able to talk to them. But you, you really don't have anything to talk about yet. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. I'm not sure what you're discussing. Um, so let's say that you have ace queen of diamonds. Shh, 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 shh. Guys, pay attention. All right. And the board is 10 jack, 3 6 with two diamonds. There's $200 in the pot, and your opponent goes all in for $100, and you've got them covered, meaning you have more than $100. Now, I'm going to have to continue um, a similar example, which is your opponent accidentally shows you his hand, and he has a pair of threes. And I want to know, should you call or fold? I'm not going to take a survey. You guys work it out, uh, figure it out with a partner, and then I'll, we'll come back to you. OK, let me, uh, let me bring it back in right now. So. By show of hands, I know most, many of you haven't finished yet, but, I, but many of you have. Who says fold? Who says call? Okay. Um, so what was the first step that you guys did? Pot odds. And what did you get as the pot odds? Three to one, right? Everybody get three to one? If anyone didn't, we can review it. But this pot odds are pretty straightforward. Okay, now, um, just show of hands, how many outs did you count? This one's tricky. You're saying 10? Did anyone get anything other than 10? It's 10. <laughs> it is 10. <laughs> so the reason that it's 10 is that any king and any diamond, except the three of diamonds or the six of diamonds, right? Because that gives them a full house. So the other thing is that even though you need um, nine for a flush, you can't count uh, the king twice. So that's how you can get 10 and not 11. So very good, everyone that got 10. That's not so easy. Um, so if you have 10 outs, then what are your odds against? There's 36 bad cards, right? 10 good cards, so 3.6 to 1. Is that what people got? You guys disagreeing? Maybe I, it's possible I did it wrong. What's that? Odds against? Anybody? Lucas, help us out. 3.4, okay. I know you're really good at dividing, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to argue. So if your pot odds are 3 to 1 and your odds against are 3.4 to 1, fold. Right? OK. Now, let's, let's make it a little trickier. What if your opponent had the ace of hearts and the three hearts instead of the two threes? Well, I'll just tell you that now a queen is an out for you because he only has, if he has ace three, he only has a pair of threes. The ace is not an out for you because it gives him two pair. Um, so you have, um, you have more outs that, because you have the queens, and if you add up all the outs with ace three of hearts, you're going to get 14 outs. And so you're getting 2.3 to 1, which is better than 3 to 1, and so you're going to call. Okay, so now let's, look at a, let's flip this problem around. And let's look at pot odds. And this one will give us a very important lesson in poker. On the turn, you have top pair, top kicker. Top pair, top kicker is like you have ace, queen, and the board is queen high. OK, you have the top pair out of the three board on the flop and, and on the turn. So there's four cards out there, and you have the one that's the highest plus an ace. That's top pair, top kicker. There's $100 in the pot. And the question is, what is the minimum that you should bet so that it's a mistake for him to call? OK, what do I mean by that? It means that you want your opponent to call if the odds against are better than the pot odds for your opponent, right? That's a mistake. He's supposed to only call if the pot odds are better. And so the question is, um, you don't want to bet more than you need to bet, but what is the minimum that you can bet so that your opponent makes a mistake. Um, and 
I fear that only the STEM-focused students in here are likely to have intuitions about this. I could be wrong, too. That could be a bias of mine. But I don't want to spend too much class time, so I'm going to show you guys how to work through this answer. If this were a graded class, I guarantee you this would be a homework problem. So th let's, let's, let's think about the intuition and not just the solution here. So the odds against um, of our opponent, we're saying that our opponent has a flush draw. And so our opponent has nine outs in general, right? Excepting for weird full house situations, let's just say our opponent has nine outs. If our opponent has nine outs, we're not going to start with the pot odds. We're going to start from the odds against to see what our target is, right? We want to know what is the number that we want him to have higher than his pot odds. So he has 37 bad cards that don't make his flush, and our top pair top kicker is good. And he has nine cards that give him the flush. And you can already see that now I don't need to explain why it's nine. So from now on, you're always going to know if there's a flush draw out, that's nine outs, right? Because you're going to have four clubs and there's nine more clubs. It could also be hearts. I don't know why I've been sticking with clubs. Um, so that means 4.1 to 1. And let's, let's just round it to 4 to 1, OK? That means that if he's getting worse odds than 4 to 1, then it's a mistake for him to call, right? We can write that as a formula and say the pot odds are 4 to 1 means that the $100 in the pot plus the bet divided by the bet equals 4, right? Because remember Nikki Numbers was talking about you take the pot, you add the bet, you divide by the bet. He had like 6 plus 3 divided by 3. So in this case, I said there's $100 in the pot. We add x, which is what we're solving for, which is what is the amount of the bet. We divide that quantity by x, which is the bet. And if that equals 4, that means that it's neither a mistake nor a benefit for him to call, right? If the pot odds are the same as the odds again, against, it's a toss-up, right? You're even money. There's no benefit. It's like betting on red or black with, with perfect evenness. So that's the number we want, because anything bigger than that is going to be a mistake for him to call. So we solve for x, and we see that x equals 33. And let's think about that I intuition. 33 is 1 third. Um, so if we bet a third of the pot, then it's not a mistake for him to call, but it also doesn't help us. It doesn't help him, it doesn't help us. We're going to be even expectation on this. So anything that we bet that's bigger than 33 gives him the wrong odds to call. And that gives you a really nice, handy rule of thumb when you're playing poker. If you think you're up against a flush, or flush draw, I should say. So like there's, there's two hearts on the board, and your opponent is calling all your bets. So you're like, he's not raising. My opponent probably is on a heart draw. If you bet more than a third of the pot, so if you bet a half of the pot or three quarters, it will be a mistake for them to call if indeed they're on a flush draw. And poker is about edges. It's about making your opponent make a mistake. And so this is mathematically proving that if someone's on a flush or a straight draw, which are very similar number of outs, a straight draw is usually eight outs, the two cards below and the two cards above, or in a double belly buster, you know, the two cards, and, and uh, the four cards of those two cards that give you the straight. Um, betting half the pot is very, very safe. Now, we could do the same for any number of outs. If we think our opponent has 11 outs for some reason, we can calculate what is the right bet to make it a mistake for them to call, right? And you should have a purpose for a bet. A lot of poker players, they just throw a bet out there they don't think, in fact, in Poker Stars, it's very easy because they'll almost have like a default bet, a default bet size, and they don't change it on later streets. But there's a very convenient button in Poker Stars, which is bet half the pot. You'll be better than 90% of the, of the amateurs that, that are playing poker if you just always hit that half pot bet. Now, there are reasons to bet full pot. There are reasons to overbet the pot. There are reasons to bet a lot less than the pot. We're going to look at a lot of these. But if you just bet half the pot, you're charging the draws more than they should be calling, 
And so that's a good thing to do when you want to bet. And always try to consider what your opponent's hand is and try to force them to make a mistake. So the idea is not to give your opponent the odds to call. And if you bet half the pot or three quarters, that's a good amount. You're the house, you want every edge, you want them to make mistakes. And now the flip side of that is don't you call when you're not getting the odds. So if you're on a flush draw, you have two spades, there are two spades on the board, your cards are low, so you're, you're not going to win if you hit your, your cards. Uh, pretty much you're only going to win if you hit your flush. Somebody bets out three quarters of the pot, you probably should just fold. Now, there are some limitations to pot odds. It's not the be-all, end-all. You don't really know what your opponent has. It was nice of me to say that they accidentally exposed their cards. The number of times that that's really going to happen is very small. It's also hard to play if your opponent is tricky. So part of poker is playing correctly, but another part of poker is deception. Let's say, for example, that your opponent knows that you took this class. They've watched you play, and they're so impressed with how you play, they know you're a good player. And they know that you're never going to call a half pot bet with a flush draw. And there are a lot of players I know that if somebody calls a half pot bet, I know they're not on a flush draw. Okay, well, you can use that to your advantage, right? Say, well, I know that he thinks that if I call a bet for half the pot, I'm not on a flush draw, and I am on a flush draw, so I call the bet. And now he doesn't think I'm on a flush draw, the flush comes, I've got a great opportunity to make money. He never put me on a flush draw because I didn't play it like a flush draw. So when I say someone played the hand like a flush draw, it means that they called small bets, folded to big bets, and sometimes people even raise when they're on a draw, and we're going to get to that. Not every decision is an all-in situation. So we've looked at like three or four hands today, and all of them were like, there's $50 in the pot, you go all in for 20, do you call or fold? But what if you have $1,000 in front of you, and then somebody bets 50? Your entire decision doesn't relate to that $50, because that might be on the turn, you might be able to bet $300 on the river, and you need to take that into account. Now, Pot odds can be calculated on the flop when there are still two cards to come. And I think it's the most important concept in, in No Limit Hold'em. And we're going, I'm going to have somebody really famous explain this to you in a couple minute video. The person's name is Phil Helmuth. How many of you have ever heard of Phil Helmuth? Okay, quite a few people. He is the winningest tournament, tournament player in the world. He has 15 World Series of Poker bracelets. I think the second highest is like six. He has five World Poker Tour final tables. In just tournaments alone, he's won $14 million at the World Series of Poker. That doesn't count as WPT winnings or his cash game winnings, which probably way exceed that. He's fifth in the all-time money ranking in the world in poker. His nickname is the Poker Brat. If you've ever seen him play on TV, he's a very bad sport. He's a horrible winner and a horrible loser. He's just a brat. It's an image that's earned him a lot of endorsements. I don't know if he fakes it or not. I've seen him play in person. He's very nice until the cameras are rolling, and then he's a real jerk. So maybe it's just an, an image. But he will tell you, if you ask, that he's the greatest, and even if you don't ask, that he's the greatest of all time. <laughs> that said, he is a very smart guy. He really knows poker, and he wants to tell you guys about outs. All right. Um, that was a good time to cut him off. Uh, so I, I was watching TV at home, and this screen came on, and I said, this is a good one for the class. So I paused the TV and took a picture. So the quality isn't that great. But the interesting question is, how many outs does Mark have? Because this one's a little tricky. So just uh, when you get it, uh, show me hands. I'm curious to know how many outs you think there are here. So you see that, that Mark is losing because Paul has a two pair, fours and queens, and Mark just has ace high. But there are outs that will give Mark the winning hand. Hold on. OK, right here. There are 12 outs. Does everybody see why there are 12 outs? Three aces, three kings, three sevens, and three fives. 
So those are tricky. Remember counterfeiting? So if a seven comes on the river, Mark's hand is queens and sevens with an ace, and Paul's hand is queens and sevens with a five. Paul just loses his hand completely if a five, a seven come on the board. And the ace and the king give Mark the winning hand because he'll have a bigger two pair. Yes? So if you got two more diamonds or a jack 10, those are like the running outs? Well, you can have running outs once the turn comes. Yeah, so on the flop, you can have running outs. And we'll talk about running outs later. Is there anyone that's not clear yet on why there's 12 outs? OK. So I've oversimplified everything to a fault so far. Calculating your outs is much, much harder when you don't actually know what your opponent has, which is the case in poker. So you're going to have to have some guesswork in there. And you basically are trying to figure out what your opponent has. Um, sometimes what you think is an out, as Phil said, and one of our students observed earlier, actually gives your opponent a better hand than you. You hit your straight, but it gives him the flush. Let's say that you're in middle position and you have queen 10 of spades. And your opponent behind you is in position and he calls. And the flop comes ace, jack, eight. OK, let's just look at that flop for a minute and think about it. OK, so we, we really haven't hit anything, right? We, there's an ace on the board. and. Um, we just have a queen high, and you raised pre-flop. So now, when your opponent called, there's a lot of times that he has an ace in his hand, right? But if he has a jack or an eight, we could be in bad shape. If he has nine, 10, he could have a straight draw, although we have one of the tens. That's the kind of reasoning you do when you see a flop like this. And you check, and now he bets. And you want to know how many outs do you have. Well, the problem is, you don't know what he has. So now we need to start doing some estimation and look at different scenarios. So up in the top right, I've written my hand, which is queen 10 and the flop. And let's look at the possibilities that our opponent has. He could have a really big hand, right? He could have two pair or better. If he has two pair or better, we need a king or a nine for a straight. So then we have eight outs, right? We, uh, we have a backdoor flood. Your opponent could have. Um, I'm sorry, your opponent has the big hand, so we have a backdoor flush draw, which is that if we get a spade on the turn, which is possible 10 out of 47 probability, because there are 10 more spades, and there are 47 unknown cards, and 9 out of 46 on the river to also hit a, a spade, we're going to call that two outs. Now, Phil Helmuth gave that example. Typically, you're going to assign one or two outs as credit to your hand if you have backdoor, straight, or flush. And a backdoor means that you need it on the turn and on the river. OK, so let me slow down there a minute. I said a lot of things. Um, on the flop, you can have backdoor outs. Backdoor outs means you have to hit the right card on the turn and the right card on the river. And here I've shown that the, the odds of hitting your card on the turn can be calculated as the total number of cards you don't know. And you divide the good cards by that. And then you multiply that by the good cards divided by the total cards on the river. And whereas normally we're going to take eight outs for a straight and nine outs for a flush, we're only going to take two if it's backdoor. We're just going to take a little piece. Um, now, even if we hit, he could have a full house. So we're going to subtract two outs from that. So there go our two outs. So let's assign our, a big hand, two pair better. We're going to say we have eight outs. It's very, very unscientific. But it's the best we can do. We have to play poker. We can't just walk away because we don't know what our opponent has. So we're going to say that, well, if he has two pair better, I'm going to say that's eight outs. Now let's look at the situation where he just has an ace in his hand. This is called a naked ace because he doesn't have anything to go with it. So he doesn't have two pair. He doesn't have ace jack. That would have been in the first category. Uh, and he can't have really any big draws if he has an ace because there's no flushes out there. All three. Um, this flop is called a rainbow. When all three of the suits are different, it's a rainbow flop. And so you don't have to worry about flushes. So we're going to say that we have um, 10 outs if he has an ace in his hand. Why are we saying we have 10 outs? Well, the queen and the 10 are no good, right? And so we need to hit our straight, a king or a nine, or 
backdoor, backdoor uh, flushes. And so we're going to take a little bit of outs for that. Let's say he has a jack in his hand. Now we have three more outs because the queen becomes an out, right? If he has like uh, a hand like jack six, which he probably wouldn't have, but um, if he has king jack, king jack is actually something you really hope that he has. And the reason you hope he has king jack is if a king comes, he's going to make two pair and you're going to make a straight. So anytime you can improve your hand and your opponent will improve but not as much as you do, that's a good thing. If he has a lower pair, let's say he has a pair of sixes or a pair of sevens, you've got 16 outs um, uh, right there because you're also going to count the tens that are in the deck. But we actually have no idea what he has, right? And so we don't know. So in this case, once we look at all the different scenarios, one is eight outs, one is 10, one is 13, one is 16, we're going to just say, well, let's assume that we have 10 outs. And this is the kind of thing that you have to do. Sometimes you know very clearly how many outs you have. Let's say there's four clubs on the board, you've got a set, we had an example like that earlier, you have 10 outs because you need one of the cards on the board to pair or you need your card to hit you for four of a kind. But in many cases, like this scenario here, you just have to guess and say, well, I'm gonna say that I have 10 outs. And here's a handy outs table that tells you for the different types of hands that you might need, uh, how many outs you have. Now, experienced poker players, uh, they know this by heart. They don't even have to look at this chart or think about it. So let's say you have two pair and you need a full house or an inside straight draw, you have four outs. So inside straight draw, uh, Phil Helmuth called that a gut shot. And um, a gut shot is basically, there's only one card that gives you a straight. He gave the example of uh, you have nine, nine, 10 and queen king in your, in your hand and the board together. So you need a 10 for a straight. That's a gut shot straight draw. So you obviously have four outs with a gut shot straight draw. Um, if you have two over cards and you need to make a pair, you have six outs, right? Because it's the two cards. Um, so two over cards to your opponent's pair is what that means. Open-ended straight draw is going to be eight outs. You hit either of those two cards and there's four of them. Flush draw is nine. We've been over that one a few times, etc. Now a rule of thumb is that 14 outs can make you even money against a better hand. If you're even money, then there's no bet that should ever scare you away on the flop with two cards to come, right? So if you have two cards left to come and you can figure out that you reliably have 14 outs, never ever fold the hand on the flop. You might want to go all in. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about here with respect to outs is express odds versus implied odds. So we looked at pot odds and that was when you're all in, it's easy math, you have to take the pot, you add the bet to it, you divide by the bet, and those are your odds. But what, all the examples that we looked at, it was for all of your chips, right? So there are not going to be any more decisions left in the hand. But what happens if you still have chips behind? So what happens, for example, if on the flop, I only have eight outs for a straight, but we have deep stacks, we have a lot of money left, and you make a bet that's three quarters of the pot. The express odds tell me that with my straight draw and a three quarter of the pot bet, I'm supposed to fold, right? If we did that calculation right now, everybody would raise their hand, fold. That's true if it's all in. But what if I know that my opponent likes his hand? He's got two pair, he's, got, he's strong, the way he's playing it, and I know that my straight is gonna be well disguised. My straight could come and he wouldn't even see it. So if I do a straight pot odds calculation, it tells me that my pot odds are not big enough with respect to my odds against for me to make that call. But on the river, I know that if I hit my straight, I'm gonna get another really big bet because at that point the pot will have the turn bets in it from both players. And in that case, I could win a lot more money. The money is implied. And so those are called your implied odds. And the implied odds are not just your current odds, but taking into account future betting that could happen. Let's look real quickly at an example of implied odds 
Um, and then I think we're out of time. So you have king jack of spades in your hand. And the board after the turn is like this. So your head's up in position, just two players. And you have $500 in your stack, and so does your opponent. Now, your opponent bets, uh, bets $100, and you think, ah, I'm guessing he has an ace. Regardless, I know that I'm behind. And the question is, should you call, fold, or raise? And so here's the situation. There's 180 in the pot. You have $500, and so does your opponent. You could do the pot odds. You're getting 2.8 to 1. Your odds against 4 to 1. We know how to do these calculations, so I'll fly through it. Obviously, this is a do not call situation, right? Do you fold? Well, maybe not. If you call on the river, then the pot will be 380, and you'll each have $400 left. If you miss your draw, you're not going to put any more in the pot. So you know that. Your opponent doesn't know that. You're probably going to lose. But scenarios, if you hit your draw, he might bet, and we could raise, and either way, we're going to win more. Why would we raise? Well, we hit our draw. We have a flush. We're, we have the best possible flush at that point, unless the board pairs. When, it, when another spade comes, we'll have the nuts. We'll have the best possible hand. He could check, and we'd bet 100 into 380, and he would probably call because we'd be giving him 4.8 to 1. Think about this. Your opponents are doing pot odds calculations as well. If you're giving your opponent 4.8 to 1, they're probably going to call you if they have anything. He could check, and we could bet 200, and now he's getting 2.9 to 1. Maybe he'll call, maybe he won't. Remember, we think he has an ace. People like their paired aces. And he might check, and we go all in for 400, and maybe he would call. So the turn decision is whether or not you're going to win an extra 100 on the river, um, or whether you're going to win 150 on the river. That changes your pot odds if you take implied odds into account instead of express odds. So the factors to consider is how likely would the opponent be to call the $200 bet on the river if a spade came? How likely is he to realize that I'm drawing to a spade? Um, will he think I'm bluffing if I go all in on the river and call me? So implied odds is a much more advanced concept than express odds. And my decision here is that it's OK to fold, even if you're not getting the right odds, though I would probably call here, because we had $500 to start the hand, and my, my, uh, my, implied, odd, my implied odds are very good. OK, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, one thing, everybody, if you have not signed on for Poker Stars yet, please sign on to that. We're going to be approving them today. And please start playing.